weekend we began Mark 2, and today we're going to work all our way uh, through Mark 2 and into Mark 3. And after the healing of the paralyzed man whose friends broke through the roof for him, all right, in Mark 2, it follows this pattern. I want you all to be able to see this, okay, because today you're going to get really frustrated with the Pharisees. Because the rest of Mark 2 follows this particular pattern. is this. Jesus shows up, does something amazing and unorthodox. The Pharisees have opinions and questions about it. Jesus answers their questions. And then the Pharisees disappear until they ask the next question. Now, here's, the, here's what we see. The challenge is not that, they're que- is not that, that God doesn't honor questions. How many of y'all know you thank God that he honors questions? But here's what we're seeing here is that their questions were only brought from an arrogant perspective and not a holy curiosity that Jesus wants us to have. Their questions are actually criticisms, and Jesus shows us how to respond to them. How many, I'm not going to ask for a raising of hands, but how many of you would say, hey, learning about how to, how to take criticism, this is a timely message for me, PC, all right? This is an incredible uh, response to all these religious people. I can only imagine the exhaustion that Jesus must have had because essentially what you've got is that the creator is trying to explain himself to the created. Can you imagine the arrogance that was there? All right, so look at this. Now, the Pharisees, what we got to understand about this group called the Pharisees, they were a respected conservative religious group, and they were often at odds with Jesus. The name Pharisee actually means separated ones. They separated themselves from everything that they thought was unholy, and they thought everyone except themselves were, se- uh, were separated from the love of God. All right? Last weekend, we discussed how Jesus answered the moral question, isn't God the only one who can forgive sins? And today we pick up in verse 12 where we see that Jesus first answers the social question. All right, look at verse 12, it says this. He went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth, and he said to them, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as he reclined at a table at his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with tax collectors and sinners, he said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Now watch with me. For those of us that have been together with us since the beginning of, uh, of the book of Mark, I want you to notice with me and even make notes in your, uh, in, your, uh, in your book. Notice with me how in the book of Mark, the narrative is always shifting from crowds to individuals. Okay, And Jesus, he's already drafted two sets of brothers, and now he recruits a tax collector, Levi, also known as Matthew. Now, here's one of the things we got to understand. When Jesus recruits us, we have no idea where he will actually take us. All right? Uh, Matthew had no idea that he would write the gospel that opens our New Testament. But if we think about it, his ability to log tax records made him an ideal person to take shorthand notes of Jesus' teachings and parables. Here's what we got to understand about God. God never gives us the big picture. He just asks us to take the next step. All right? And we just have to be willing to get up and follow him, and that's what Matthew does. And when we follow Jesus, here's what we learn. We learn that we don't follow Jesus by ourselves. And guess what? We don't get to choose Jesus' as friends. And Jesus' friends must become our friends even when our opinions and personalities differ from theirs, all right? Maybe later on, for those of us that from time to time get get, get a little bit too caught up about every four years in the election, perhaps we should post this just to keep us accountable to be respectful to those in November who may vote differently than us. Thank you for all three of you that gave me an amen on that, all right? Here's what we got to understand. The Pharisees never understood that God's friends must become our friends. And that's why they asked, why are you eating with these people? Notice with me, this is the third time in two chapters that Jesus was in someone's house. 
Why? Because when Jesus calls us, the first place he calls us is to our homes. Our homes are where the issues of life unfold every day. The Pharisees objected to Jesus keeping, keeping company with sinners. They couldn't handle the fact that Jesus was gregarious. He liked everybody. So many questions can be answered by the ministry of presence in the life of a Christ follower. You know what? We're just there. We just keep on showing up. We just keep on serving. We ain't asking for no applause. What we're doing is we're coming alongside and we're earning the right to be heard. I got to let you know, this next football season, I'm chaplain for two football teams. Base Out Academy, Daphne High School. How are you going to make it happen? I don't know. But I'm going to keep on showing up. Why? Because this is a way that I get to serve our community. Let me let you know something. When Jesus says that he came not to call the righteous but sinners, what he is saying is that he didn't come for those who believe that they can heal themselves. He came for those who know that they are not morally or spiritually able to heal themselves. In the next verse, we see that Jesus answers the ethical question. It says this, now Jesus' disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. And people came and said to him, why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast on that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth to an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and the a worse tear is made. And no one who puts new wine into old wine skins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wine skins. So here now we see that they pick on Jesus. At first they can pick with, uh, picked uh, on Jesus for who he ate with. And now they complain why he ain't why he fasting. And by asking, why aren't your disciples fasting? Here's what they're saying is, look, the, the pupil only do, uh, does what they see the teacher do, all right? If Jesus was feasting, so were there. Now, the Pharisees were well known for fasting twice a week. And, and Jesus would bust on them from time to time. Like, they're going to shrink up their face and stuff like that. Oh, I'm fasting. Jesus, you're so important to me. Oh, and and he was, he's like, don't be like them. All the time, but walking around like, hey, I, I would help you out today, but I'm, I'm just fasting. I mean, it's kind of one of those things when uh, somebody uh, says, you know, uh, you know how to find out if somebody's a vegetarian? Wait 10 seconds and they'll tell you, you know? <laughs> and so I, I was laughing at that. I'm like, okay, yeah, I, I, I get it. Here's what we got to understand. God is not against fasting. He's actually for fasting, but fasting has this time and a place in the Christian life. By using the illustration of a wedding, Jesus draws this powerful picture among the Jews. Because during the week-long wedding celebration, rabbis declared something. Watch this. They said this, joy is more important than observing a religious ritual. Wow. And in the days of Jesus, some rabbis declared that if the observance of any law came in the way of having a good time during a wedding, you did not have to keep the law. They said, you know what? Just go and have a good time. Marriage feasts were times of extraordinary festivity. Here's what we, you and I can take from this. We see here that from the day one, Jesus knew why he had come. He knew he was headed for crucifixion, but he wasn't showing any anxiety about it. In the face of impending suffering, Jesus teaches his disciples to enjoy the moment. He's saying, be where your feet are. Enjoy the moment. I remember, uh, one of the things I love so much about my son, he bursts with vision. All the time. Whenever we were little, uh, he'd be thinking about uh, uh, the day, hey, we're going to go down uh, to Uncle Will's house, and we're going to uh, go and be on, uh, be on the boat and stuff like that. I'm going to be with my best buddy, William. As soon as we arrived on the dock, he's like, Dad, can William uh, stay, to, uh, stay the night with us? I was like, son, enjoy the moment. Be where your feet are. Some of you are like, every, every kid's like that. But here's what we got to understand. Jesus right now, he, he is showing us slowly, Mark is showing us slowly that Pharisees were not happy on the inside and unhappy people don't enjoy being around happy people, all right? Jesus was not going to let Debbie Downer ruin their good time. That's kind of cool to know, isn't it? The next thing we see is that Jesus now answers their legal question. It says, one Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? He answered, 
Have you never read? That this is so cool. When Jesus said, have you never read? These guys had the Bible memorized. He's like, yeah, you think you know something, but you don't know something. He goes, he says, look, why are they doing what's unlawful on the Sabbath? He said, have you never read what Jesus did when he and his companions were hungry and then in need? In the days of Abiathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the son of man is Lord even over the Sabbath. Now watch this. There was nothing wrong with what they did because gleaning was not considered stealing according to Deuteronomy 23, 25. The issue was this, the day on which they did it, all right? Now, here's what we got to understand. If you really want a really fun research project, all right, prepare to, be, to, prepare to take a couple of hours on this, all right? Because the rabbis made an elaborate list of do's and don'ts relevant to the Sabbath, and this one violated the items on their list. The only problem was it wasn't the item on God's list, okay? And at this time, rabbis filled Judaism with re- elaborate, uh, elaborate rituals related to the Sabbath and the observance of the Sabbath, okay? So one thing that you couldn't do on the Sabbath, you couldn't carry your mat, all right? So, uh-uh, you worked, all right? Now, here's where you and I would find something really, really, really crazy, all right? Let's just, okay, you're in the desert, it's very dry, and you've been breathing in sand and stuff like that, and all of a sudden, you're like, dude, I got to spit. My mouth is full of sand. On the Sabbath, if you had to spit, you had to spit on a rock. Because if you spit on the dirt, you will have made mud, and then you would have worked on the Sabbath. How many of y'all know that's what religion does? Yeah, yeah, it chokes things out where you're like, aren't we kind of missing the entire point of this? I mean, so later on we see, not in, not in the book of Mark, but one time there was a blind man that came up to him on the Sabbath, wanting to be healed. Guess what Jesus does? He spits in the dirt. Yeah. Yeah. He, all of a sudden he puts the mud on their eyes and everything like that. Ew, that's gross. Jesus was gross. I, was like, I, I can sit there and tell you, the only reason why you think that's, that's gross is because you ain't blind. Yeah. Because if you were blind, you'd be like, hock it right here, Jesus. <laughs> I'm about it, about it. You know, I want to see so... How many of y'all know I'm still a big youth pastor that just says stupid stuff? (laughs) Jesus never violated God's command to observe the Sabbath, but he often broke legalistic additions to that law. And sometimes it seemed like he deliberately wanted to break them. Jesus showed an important principle that human need is more important than religious ritual. The Sabbath was meant to serve mankind, and and this is exactly what people who are steeped in tradition simply cannot understand. This is incredibly hard to understand for many people that what God really wants is mercy before sacrifice. And that to love others, that love to others is more important than religious ritual. And today before we leave, we're going to concentrate on the end of Mark chapter 3 where the legal question continues. It says this in verse 1. And again, he entered the synagogue and a man was there with a withered hand. What we're seeing here is for all of us because all of us are in church today because we, are, uh, we all have something in our lives that's shriveling. Maybe our emotions are shriveled because of a recent event. Maybe our ambition is is shriveling because we aren't at the place where we want to be in our career. Maybe a relationship or marriage is shriveled and we're just shattered by it. Every one of us, somewhere in our lives, our reach is not as far as we want it to go. And we're like this man because maybe we don't have a disease like so many people that we've read about in the past three weeks that Jesus has healed. And maybe we're not possessed by a demon like the people Jesus delivered, but we know All of us here, we know that we aren't all that we could be, and we just feel shriveled. Can I tell you, you're in the right place today. Look at the next verse, it says this. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. All right? I want you to see the evil in this. They weren't hoping that someone would be healed. They hated the fact that somebody might be healed on the Sabbath. There's no holy curiosity, there's no godly awe or divine wonder, just cold-hearted judgment. 
I have some pastor friends who are, who are actually scared to quote pastors and theologians in their message because they say that immediately some people in their church will research the people that they quote and see if they're in the Reformed camp or not. And so one guy's opening up to me the other day at a baseball game, and he's like, I suppose you, y'all deal with that at Coastal all the time. I said, I, no, look, normally I like to join people in their pain, all right? <laughs> Just not in this. I was like, don't try to bring me into your world, all right? I looked at him and said, no, we really don't. And I said, sounds like to me you need, you need to sing some Beyonce to this guy. <laughs> oh, there's actually a group over there. And he goes, Beyonce? What, what Beyonce song you want me to sing to him? I said, to the left, to the left, everything you own in a box, to the left. Kick him out. Get him out of there. <laughs> he said, he goes, what, what do you mean? See, I noticed some things growing up in the church world the last 31 years that Pharisees say things like, this church is getting too big. Doesn't happen here, though, all right? But the church wasn't too big before they came. Let me ask you, ask the question for any of your friends that may say that to you from time to time. Well, the church where I go, it's just getting too big. My question is this, is heaven too big? Something you may want to think about. Most of the time when people say this, it's because they can't do their own thing or they can no longer get their preferences. It's not that their church got too big. It's that they didn't grow in their spiritual lives and they became too small. Pharisees will distort the mission of God and shrink the work that God wants to do in the church. And so I just told him, I was giving this guy some counsel. He didn't listen to me worth nothing. But anyway, I said, I said, just tell them the best thing about Baldwin County is the, is the wide variety of churches. I said, you can tell them I love you and Jesus loves you, but Patna, this ain't the church for you. And I said, and guess what you can be saying after the meeting? You can walk away and be, continue to sing Beyonce saying, you must not know about me. You must. I mean, understand something. What we, the reason why we don't deal with this here is because the Gulf Coast will be saved. Every church needs to be in a building program until Jesus comes back because a lot of folks need Jesus where we live. In life, Pharisees are never players. They're only referees. Have you ever noticed that? Notice what the scripture says. That says they sat and they watched to see if he'd heal on the Sabbath. Why? Because religion only sits and judges. The gospel reaches out in grace to help. I was so proud of our ladies that showed up uh, uh, this, uh, this Friday night. Had well over 400 ladies that were here. And we gave over $20,000 to the Women's Care Medical Center. But ladies and gentlemen, not only is that awesome. I want a better round of applause for the 35 men that showed up and served these ladies. It was wonderful to see. Why? Because that's what the gospel does. You know what? The gospel reaches out in grace to help. And let's see what Jesus is about to do. Look at the next verse. It says this. And he said to the man with the withered hand, come here. You know, here's here's what's kind of cool. A disfigured person already feels different, but now he gets singled out. And perhaps he's sitting in the back and in the corner away from everybody trying not to be noticed like some of the people may be feeling here today. But hallelujah, we are here. There's something great about someone who just keeps showing up even though they feel awkward. And Jesus is about to show him that his motive was not to embarrass him, but to make him whole. All right. Here's one thing I've noticed about how Jesus works. Okay. For all of us shy people, can't you just tell that I'm just ever so shy? No. Here's what we got to understand. In order for us to become whole, Jesus will often ask us to leave our seat of anonymity. If the man doesn't stand up, he misses out what God has for him. And in order for us to come forward, we must first believe that God has good intentions for us when he calls us out. All right? Jesus is also showing us that we are never exempt from doing good when we have the means to do so. So it says this, and he said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. And he looked around them, uh, around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart. Now watch this. This Bible, our Bible says he looked at them with anger. All right. 
Jesus is just getting fed up with their insensitivity, their stubborn hearts, and their judgmental attitudes. This, they had all the supposed wisdom, but they still didn't know what the Sabbath was all about. The Sabbath was about restoring the diminished. The Sabbath is about replenishing drained people. The Sabbath is about allowing God to repair the broken things in our lives. That's why we keep showing up on Sunday mornings, because we're carrying some burdens that we may not even know anything about. And then God calls us out and he, says, he calls attention to it and says, let me help you with that. Church attendance is a discipline just like working out is. Some of us may not like hearing that who may be watching us boatside, beachside, bedside, or poolside right now, all right? We love you. Thank you for watching. It can be hard to get here, isn't it? That's the reason why when we go on our sabbatical that our board makes us go on every year. That's why I go to church every weekend. I never want to forget how hard it is for some people to go to church. And I never want to forget how hard it is to not only get to church, but to get to church on time. And then how impossible it can be to get, on church, uh, get to church on time with a child. All right, And so I always want to keep myself in your shoes. But here's what we got to understand. It can be hard to get to church, but we're thankful that we did it when it's over. Just like a workout. You're like, what? So one of my gyms says, hey, thanks for being here. And sometimes that's the hardest part. I'm like, yeah, he's right. I am here on faith, working out in faith. Uh, what's your fitness goals? To not go to heaven early. That's it. All right. Jesus is mad at them because their hearts are more shriveled than that guy's hand was. Wow. Says, and he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored. Yes. Jesus here shows us what to do with righteous anger. God wants us to get angry in the right way about something that he wants corrected. Yeah. Okay? Watch this. Write this down. When righteous anger is released, it is used to heal. Godly anger destroys injustice. William Wilberforce used his anger uh, uh, against slavery and he abolished it in England. What is it? Let me just ask you this. What is it that just ticks you off? Because I can tell you something, more than likely it's related to your purpose and it's the problem that God may have designed you to heal. So what is it that ticks you off? Is it just crappy music? Or like, dear God. God, why would anybody listen to this? Maybe God's calling you to fix it. Is, is it people being exploited? By, uh, is it seeing the, uh, people exploit the poor and the defenseless where they're like, I cannot stand that? Some of us are like that. I would encourage you to remember that come voting season whenever we vote down the lottery. Wow. Why are you saying that, PC? Let me tell you something. Because it's a tax on poor people, and God will not bless exploiting poor people. Don't vote. We don't need it. God can bless us without it. That's right. Amen. Woo, I, like, I got a couple of amens on that one. Wait, wait for the silence here. It says it right in my notes. Here, you know what my first frustration was? Seeing teenagers disengaged from the local church. I was in Bible college. I didn't know what I was going to do. I got offered to plan a church. I got offered to go do this and this. But you know what ticked me off the most? Is that there were teenagers that were at church and they did not want to be there. They hated it. They were there because their parents, uh, their parents were forcing them to do it. And they were being led by guys who were wanting to climb the ladder. I remember one, this guy, this, well, I was at youth camp one time. And uh, this guy was, the, his kids did not respect him at all. I watched one kid like splash him in the face with water. All of a sudden one of my guys looked at me and goes, I have way too much respect for you to do that. I was like, you better. <laughs> and he goes, I, I, I was just messing with him. He goes, dude, I'd never do that. So I was talking to the guy. I was like, hey, so why? What is, so you're a youth pastor? And he's like, yeah. I was like, do you enjoy it? He goes, well, you know, one day I want to be like a senior pastor or something like that. And I said, so why are you being a youth pastor? And he goes, well, you know, because I feel like I, this is what I'm supposed to do. I was like, yeah, but you suck at it. These, these kids don't listen to you at all, you know, because I'm an encourager. You know? <laughs> I just remember sitting there thinking, can't we do better? Can't we just look back over and say, you know what? And so I just decided one time uh, well, we, we'd gone to youth services and stuff like that. And so we went into a youth service one night and, uh, and I looked at Jennifer. I said, this was wrong. This is wrong. And this is wrong. 
And she looked at me and she goes, my God, Chad, does anybody do it right? I said, we're going to do it right. right. And let me tell you something. God broke my heart for, for students all over America. Why? Because that's what he wants us to do. He wants to create a firestorm of frustration in our hearts so that we can feel the heart of God and want to roll up our sleeves and fix it. That's what righteous anger does. It's, it's, uh, anger can fill us up with the right energy to do the right thing. Now watch this. He said, the Pharisees, this is how it ends. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with, Her- with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. All right? And just like righteous anger is used to heal, we see here this, that unrighteous anger kills and leads to destruction. What we, how do we know this? Because the Pharisees and the Herodians hated each other. All right? They were polar opposite in everything in life. Politics, religion, the social spectrum. The Pharisees despised Herod's government and the Herodians broke religious laws left and right. Just like they perceived Jesus did. But they found common ground in one thing, their hatred for Jesus. Their anger overrode all of their passions. They said, I hate these guys, but I hate Jesus more. I'm reading a book. It's a great book called The Leadership Secrets of Nick Saban, all right? Some of you may have already read it, and some of you I see filing it away for a purchase later on. They said Nick Saban is mostly known in the coaching world for his recruiting. And so everybody just naturally assumes that Nick Saban loves recruiting, and he hates it. He physically hates it. But but the author says this. They said, Saban understood something a long time ago. That he may hate recruiting, but the thing he hated more was playing with crappy players. <laughs> and so he became the world's best at it. All right? Here's something that we need to know about unrighteous anger. Unrighteous anger also can lead to destructive alliances. Wow. Listen to me. This is a little pastoral moment. Be careful with what binds you to another person or to another group. We would be wise to analyze our relationship and see what actually brought us together, all right? Because uh, destructive alliances don't want to heal anything. Their only goal is to get even, punish, or destroy. Last year, I was coaching special teams at Bayside Academy, and we were playing our rivals, St. Michael's, all right? We're playing very, very, very well at the time. But we are racking up penalty after penalty after penalty because after every tackle or after every block, our guys are throwing them down because they are just so stinking ticked off. And they just, they just hated them. And so I, I talked, uh, I, I gathered it, all, everybody together. I said, hey, just want to let you all know something. Smart's going to win this game. Not mad. And I said, you know the difference between me and you right now? I want to win and you want to beat them. And there's a difference. The only thing that we have to do is have one more point than them at the end of the game. This needs to be our focus. And they they focus back up. We want to overtime match with them. But here's what we got to understand. You and I, whenever we're doing things out of anger, it is going to cost us. And when we're bonded with the wrong people, understand something. All of a sudden our heart can turn and we don't even know it. I've been pastoring for a while. I'm going to tell you one thing. It, it don't matter who they are. The gossipers are going to find one another in the church. Even a church as large as I, you know what? We got hundreds of people that sit outside. We've got people that, uh, that sit inside. Let me tell you something, because that's, that's a spirit. Spirits attract spirits. Somebody could be sitting outside and somebody they never, but guess what? Satan brings them together. You know why? Because it's a spirit. And here's what we got to understand. Whenever you and I are aligned with the wrong people, I want to encourage you this week in your, in your prayer time, say, God, am I aligned with the, with the bad group right now? Am I thinking the wrong things? Because the two things that are going to rob us the most in life are thinking the wrong things and running with the wrong people. What bonded the Pharisees and the Herodians? we got to get rid of Jesus. The Pharisees had a tradition, and, and, and it was a, a values platform that emphasized moral conformity. We're like this. If you follow the rules and you live a pure life, they were all about moralism. And the Herodians were all about progressivism. Guess what they thought? 
where you just need to live a life of self-discovery so that you can decide for yourself what's right or wrong. But here's what we need to understand, especially in today's day and age, both moralism and progressivism are hostile to the message of Jesus because the good news is an offense to religion and irreligion. The gospel does not say that the good are in and the bad are out. The gospel does not say that the open-minded are in and the conservatives are out. The gospel says that the humble are in and the proud are out. The gospel says that the people who know that they are not better or not more open-minded or not any more moral than the next guy, those are the ones that are in. And it's the people who think that they're on the right side of history are the ones who are in the most danger. Jesus said, you better check your heart. Check your heart. It goes back to the moral question that we discussed earlier. When Jesus says that he came not to call the righteous but sinners, what he's saying is that he didn't come for those who believe that they can heal themselves. He came for those who know that they are not morally or spiritually able to heal themselves. In short, guess who he came for? came for the withered people. He came for the people today who is just like, God, I don't, I'm giving you one more chance. We're giving you one more chance. God, we are at our last leg. Who, the people whose reach are limited, but who answer Jesus' call to come to him and be healed. And not only to receive healing, but to become whole. And whole people, guess what? Whole people bring people on the healing journey with them. Because they, can, they realize God's a big God that he can bless all of us at the same time so that we can be the people he made us to be. And so the Gulf Coast will be safe. Let's pray. Father, thank you for coming for the withered people. Thank you for being willing to be criticized so that we can see your example and learn from it. Thank you for showing us how relationship is so much more important than religion. Thank you for showing us, God, that you came for all of us wherever we are right now. Lord, for those of us who are believers, would you expose the Phariseeism in our hearts? Would you help us to see if we are, we are linked to the wrong group? Give us your spiritual discernment so that we can prosper, so that we can grow, so that we can really see you for who you are and, Lord, see the impact that you want to make with our lives and on the Gulf Coast. We thank you for doing it. In Jesus' name, amen. With every head still bowed, every eye still closed, if you're here today, you've never given your life to Jesus. And maybe all throughout this service, you'd say, man, there's been like this pulling on me. Let me tell you what that pulling is. That's the Holy Spirit. That's the God that that created you that wants to have a relationship with you and you can begin one right here and right now. And if that's you with nobody looking around, maybe you one time served God and you drifted and fell away. Here's what I'm gonna tell you. I'm not gonna call you forward. I'm not gonna do anything to embarrass you. All I wanna do is say, lead you in a simple prayer so that tonight when you put your head on your pillow, you can know that you're right with God with nobody looking around. If you're here today and say, Pastor Chad, I'm not right with God. Would you pray for me? Would you just lift up your hand real quick? PC, pray for me. I'm not right with God today. I want to get right with God. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Those of us with our hands raised, those of us watching outside, online, in our cafe, we're all going to pray this prayer together, and you're going to be assured for heaven as if you were already there. Pray this prayer out loud with me, church. Dear Lord Jesus, you know I'm a sinner. And I know I'm a sinner and I've committed sins. But today, Lord Jesus, I give you those sins. I ask you to come into my heart, wash me clean, 